Bright Stuff and Podcast to today. Nathan Ray Raymond is my guest. He is a writer, podcaster, and yeah, he shared me a hell of a story off the air I won't talk about, but we're going to talk about the fun stuff on the air, I hope. So, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Yeah. So, what are you up to? Like, what? Like, how have you been? Well, obviously, I'm on the show right now. I'm talking (laughs) with you. Yes. But but what I mean is, like, so during this pandemic, I've been more creative doing different things that way. Yeah. So, for you, like, what has that been like for you? What's this Odyssey been like for you? The Odyssey has been, like, producing my podcast. Um learning how to get good at producing a podcast because I started like right as the pandemic was beginning. Um, It's involved meeting new people and engaging in new connections, putting myself in situations that I didn't think were all that likely even a year or two ago. Yes. I haven't done as much. Hey Jack. Hello, Jag Tress. I haven't really gotten as much writing done as I would like to, as in in fiction writing. Uh, I know that we've spoken in the past about certain ideas that I've had. And I think that I still want to work on those ideas. It's just that I have a whole lot of other stuff that I need to focus on at the moment. No, I get you. No, I, that's totally understandable. I'm I'm the one trying to make this a living, like I said, and and it's funny because it's like I just sent like so next week I have I have four page three four paychecks from four different people, all small, but they add up, right? So that and that's that's a freelance. It's like I don't get a I don't get a regular paycheck anymore. I get this like compilation, and then on top of that, it's like okay. I got to figure out how to make this last for a month. What do I pay for? Like that's freelancing one one Right. And, and, but it's, it's one of those things where I, uh, I've made that decision that that's going to be my priority. And, and honestly, hopefully I did a job interview yesterday where I, I might be hosting another show that that's going to be kind of cool. It went, the interview went really well. Um, but we'll see kind of how that goes, but like, I'm going to be moving more and more into what I'm doing. That that's been the goal for a long time. But it takes a while to get there. And in the meantime, you still got to figure out bills, food, stuff like that, and, and you got to figure out what your priorities are, right? Yeah. How are your book sales? So so. So so. I haven't released a new book in a while. When the next book comes, the, the way the business works is every every author. It's not usually the sales upfront for most of us. It's the compile the compilation of everything you've done. Um, Twenty books to fifty k. Uh, the very famous group on Facebook uh, de- talks about this concept. The idea is, it's not the book in front of you that sells. Although eventually it goes where the f- book in front of you really does start to sell. But it's the fact that okay, when I release a book, every time I release a book, all my sales go up. I have five books, so three of them are traditionally published, so I don't see a lot of royalties there. Um, and then there's my indie stuff, which I see a lot more royalties for, right? And so what it tends to happen is, um, when I have a, when I announce a book, all my sales go up. And then I release the book, they go, they, again, anyone that buys that book, now we'll look back at some of my other stuff, look at all my different stuff I've done. So the more I release, like, my goal is to have two releases by the end this year. I'm not sure how that's going to work out. If I head back to, it looks like I'm heading back to Calgary in November 1st. Might be there a little sooner than that, but like an official living place by November 1st. So yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting to answer your question up front. Like they're small, but steady. I get passive income, which is always a good thing. Yes. Are you doing anything to invest the income or is it just enough to pay your bills for the moment? Right, right now it's it's um, starting to invest, like like little things, like for example, hi, right. Scale is the next. The scale is the next step. Uh, what happened was so I'm gonna be playing with at some point really soon Facebook ads, Amazon ads, and I'm gonna see what actually works. The one that 
kind of scares me is Facebook. Why is that? Because it's shifting sand. <laughs> That's um, So Facebook ads can be lucrative. But the thing about Facebook is Facebook changes their rules all the time. So in terms of what you reach, what you scale, what you do. So you can have this really amazing ad that only five people see, which is like, or yeah, exactly. All the time. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a nightmare because it's trying to, it's trying to figure out like a, like Amazon, the thing about Amazon. Okay. I'm so right now I'm exclusively Amazon. There's pros and cons to that. One of the pros is my Amazon ads go a lot farther because I am exclusive, right? I, I can show I can show a book and it will be shown to a lot more people. Um, but the nature of advertising with books is you, for, you're you spending $1 to make two. It's not bad, but it's, it's slow building. You, you would love it if it was more like one to four or one to five, but that doesn't happen right away. And in the meantime, too, I just freelance and start writing for different magazines. All right. Mm -hmm. how about you like what 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 are your goals like you we talked about podcasting getting good as you said yeah. so what are your goals my goals at the moment are finish up this current batch of episodes that i have to produce uh by the end of my season i'm currently delayed on my latest episode because i've been busy with a whole lot of other stuff um I'm going to be starting online university in less than 10 days. I'm Congrats. going to be, yeah, thank you. I'm going to begin an undergraduate degree with uh, the open university. I'm going to be studying business management and German. And that's going to be a three year journey. If all goes well, which I don't think it will, but Hey, <laughs> uh, my plan with that, was to do full-time school online alongside full-time work uh, at my job. And so I'd just be every day, wake up, go to work, get back home, do school, go to bed, wake up, go to work, get back home, do school, go to bed. Uh, and that would be my life for about the next four to eight months. But it looks like now that Justin Trudeau has been reelected as prime minister of Canada, and if he pushes forward his policies of mandating vaccines in every area of the federal government, uh, it looks like I might lose my job by the end of the next month, which is a very interesting prospect. Um, I've lost many jobs in the years before. And I feel like this job that I've had is the first job I've ever had where I've been able to stay at it for at least a year, which is something I'm truly thankful for. And it's, it's something that amazes me to this day. I don't want to lose this job. Um, but it looks like, you know, the more, the more it's, it becomes possible, the more I have to just look at it and accept that perhaps you know, maybe this is what's what has to happen. And if this door shuts, then maybe other doors will open and I'll still find a way to not only pay my bills, but also pay my next few years of tuition. So this is the thing, right? So this this is this is I've talked to, I've talked on Facebook what I think of what's going to not likely happen with the vaccines. So we're not going to go there. But I think, though, is instead I'm going to go like this. This is, you can look at this one of two different ways. Not, because this sucks no matter which way you go. That's just the way it is. It sucks no matter which way you go. Um, if, if what's happened everywhere else over an extended period of time happens in Canada um the vaccines will not likely work here like they haven't really worked anywhere else over an extended period of time which means that there's going to be some very interesting things happening in the winter especially with the very since 
I'm again, we're seeing a lot of professionally skilled people just disappearing. They're not going to do all right. So that's coming. Whether people want to see it or not, that's that's very much the reality of this winter. Um, what a lot of those people are doing, like a lot of the nurses that are quitting, for example, one of two things is happening to them. They are either getting scooped up by other countries or they're going to do privately, you take their skills and do their own business because their skills are going to be in huge demand regardless of what the rules are. And um, that's that's the uh, that's the thing is this is this is very much a time for if you want to become autonomous and so you can't really be governed this is the time that you like gotta have a plan to do that right so when i get to calgary for example i'm going to be doing remote work but to supplement my income too i'm also going to be doing stuff like i'm making my own booze something really simple like get a distiller and use make 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 booze because it's simple it's simple but also like there's things like um like there are going to be lots of small services there's lots of ways of dealing cash and if this sounds really grim to anyone listening and watching this is what's going to happen this is the path we chose and i don't think people realize exactly what that entails anyone that's lived that's seen really rough areas no and so what you need so the um the thing about that is um you're gonna like there's going to be demand for lots of things there's going to be uh but you're gonna have to be a guy that deals in cash deals under the table and take the skills that you do have and use them you know what i mean and that's and honestly there's lots of things out there that you can do um but yeah i mean what this is going to force two or three things it's going to hemorrhage the economy big time but it's also going to create a new economy where you can barter and trade for whatever you were and that's where we're going so yeah to a degree it feels like i don't have the necessary skills or qualifications you'd to... be my surprise you'd be surprised okay um from what you know of me, from what we've interacted with each other, what do you think? Here's what I think. I've starved. I've talked about this many times on the air. Um, I've starved. I've been in situations where I did not have very much, but I discovered things about myself and what I could do to survive and endure and thrive. My biggest regret when I look back at the time, I look back at the time of when I was doing these things the first time, was I thought a lot like you do right now. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I got to go back and do what everybody else is going to do. What I wish I'd done and what I know now is, okay, I have a big mouth. How can I use my big mouth to make me money? How can I read ads or voice? Like, for example, voice work. You have a voice. You use a podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nathan Ray, and I would like to recommend to you the following product because this is how it will go let me try that ladies and gentlemen this is nathan ray and i would like to recommend the following product because it's going to change your life exactly exactly right the mindset has to change that's the thing and it's and right that's the thing. The mindset has to change. It's not what you're in Kate. Like, see, she said it. You got the voice. So, I mean, one thing you could do right now, you've got tons of experience producing audio, right? Dude, I'm interviewing for companies that need people to host shows. I have the experience for it. And yeah, but I, you're also probably more charismatic than me. No, no can't think about what you don't, what you don't think about what you don't have. Look at what you got. Stop looking at what you don't have. Because if you're going to look at don't have, you're just going to put yourself in a miserable space. Look at what you have. Right? Me, financially speaking, right this minute, I have to work very hard to get my money to come in. I could look at it like, oh my God, where's that next paycheck coming in? Flip side, I'm free. I can come and go as I choose 
Therefore, yes. As she says, you have the shades, therefore you've got the shtick. You have to put yourself in a mindset of what can I do? What opportunities can I create for myself with what I can do? Right? And do those things all the while going to school. You have a voice. You have a great voice. Use that voice. That's one like that's just one thing off the top of my head. Maybe you're a great cook. I'm not Maybe a great cook. What? Okay. Again, not looking at what you don't have. Just like honestly, take it's do do a take a notepad, take a piece of paper, write down everything you can do. And then the first that's the first page. And then the second thing you can do is how can I make money doing this? And you start building now. Don't worry, like, don't think about it. Like, don't think about it. Like, here's the deal. Whatever, like, again, whoever's listening, whatever you think about taking the, if you don't want to be forced to take a vaccine, because I do think that's, that even if it, even if I thought it worked 100% the way it was supposed to, still think that would be wrong. Um, even if you don't want 100% um, do that, then the thing is, we have technology today. We're talking across a country. We are interacting and mingling right now. The technology to reach out to people and let people know that you have an amazing voice. You can write an amazing story. You can do things for people that way is there. The trick is now you got to build that platform. The way the more self-reliant you become, the less anyone can govern you. If I can make income from a bunch of different places, right? It's not that I'm making a lot of income in one place or lot, no income in another place. It's the fact that I'm making many different forms of income. The more streams I have, the less I need any one thing. I can do everything. Most people that are wealthy have at least seven streams of income. Seven. None of that's a paycheck. None of that's a day job. Almost all of it is on services they provide for different people at different times. You're going to have to become a hustler. That you can't, you're going to have to be a bit more of a salesman. But you can do those things. They're well within your wheelhouse. But you got to look at what you can do. Not what you can't, right? What you can do. And, wor and don't worry about... Actually, I just had this uh, conversation with somebody uh, on on the air. I've been applying for jobs I'm not qualified for because it has nothing to do with qualifications. It has everything to do with how I present myself, and it's getting me job interviews. So, you know, it's 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 all about your presentation, your attitude, and your confidence. So that's what it's all about. It's going to scare you the shit out of you. It's going to put you in a weird, weird, weird place. If this is the path you're going to walk, it's going to put you in a weird, weird, weird fucking place. I think I'm but, already in that weird place it, right it, now. It, it, you're scared right now. You're not there yet, buddy. You'll get there. You've been there, I think, before too, right? You've been in that scared place. But here's the thing. You're just you. This is just now. It's just yourself. Who are you when it's hard? Because that's going to be who you're going to be for the rest of your lives. And that's what this is. Do you want to go down this path you're on? Do you want to learn German, become this great businessman, lawyer, contract, whatever it is you aspire to be? We'll talk about that in a minute. The question, the question isn't that. The question is, are you willing to walk this path you've set for yourself? If the answer is yes, then it's no longer about what you can't do it's about what you can or what are you willing to learn and do and i think you'll find when you get to that fire there's a lot more to you than you think there is all right like so no so been there myself my friend something that's interesting you were asking me earlier about what else i was up to in my life uh, recently, I acted as a volunteer campaign agent for someone who was running in the federal election. Uh, it was the uh, Libertarian 
candidate for Edmonton Center, Val okay. Keith. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, I was supposed to be handling the finances for the campaign, coordinating volunteers to make sure that they got to various campaigning events that Val wanted to do. Um, I had a very interesting experience on one of the first days of my job because in order to run a, a parliament campaign, you need to have a special campaign bank account. And so I want to be able to read my time and experience of what that was like, assuming the page starts loading up. Please start loading up. So go ahead and talk about it. Just talk about what happened. And we'll, we'll get we'll get to we'll get to the experience. We, no, you know, the no, no, like it's the way that I wrote it, it's presented in this very specific format that okay. Okay, my computer it it feels like it's crashing on me. Can you still hear me? I hear you just fine. Okay, so I'll just improvise it then. Yeah. Okay, so um, trying to find information on how to set up a campaign account. There's almost nothing on the internet that talks about what it's like. Um, and now, now that I've gone through the experience, I get to provide this special tutorial of what it's like. And so I wrote up a post titled, How Not to Open a Special Bank Account for an Election Campaign. Step one, visit your bank to see if you can open a special account for the sake of campaign fundraising. Step two, get told by one of the tellers that you need business registration papers and a license from the city. Step three, make it a point to visit a registry tomorrow afternoon. And schedule an appointment with the bank shortly after you get your papers. Step four, arrive at the registry the next day. Realize that it's understaffed and the line is extending a little bit outside of the building. Step five, wait about 40 minutes in line. Step six, arrive at the desk you're supposed to get your papers from and realize that they use terminology you barely understand. Step seven, realize that you're stretching yourself a little bit beyond your competency and make a decision to call the one person you think of who can uh, possibly explain what you're dealing with, the candidate you're supposed to be working for. Step eight, have your candidate suggest that you visit the nearest ATB financial bank so that you can open up a campaign account with relative ease. Step nine, leave the registry and leave your papers behind. Step 10, arrive at ATB financial. Get told by an employee that the bank doesn't operate campaign accounts for people running in federal elections, only provincial ones. Step 11, Realize that you're getting hungry and make your way over to the nearest Safeway. Get some takeout food that you quickly realize is overpriced. Step 12, make your way back to the registry. Wait in line for another 40 minutes. Step 13, get the chance to finally fill out your papers and register your campaign as a business. Make sure you pay a $45 fee for this service. Step 14, go to the nearest federally recognized bank, one that's of the same branch that you're usually affiliated with asks to open a business account for campaign fundraising. Step 15, get told that your registration papers are actually not what the bankers are looking for. Apparently, all they need is a document providing that you are indeed a campaign agent representing a candidate in the upcoming federal election. Step 16, show them an electronic copy of the electoral information on Elections Canada's website. Have them tell you that they need it in PDF or paper form. Realize that you can't do this because the electronic copy is only available on your phone and you can't print it elsewhere nearby. Make it a point to reschedule for another appointment when you get back home. Step 17, in a desperate attempt to get back something of value in this nihilistic mess, return to the registry and wait in line again in hopes of getting a refund. Try not to succumb to the urge of having a meltdown. Step 18, Recognize that there's a curtain hanging over one of the doors featuring a picture of the sloth from Zootopia. Understand that at this point in time, it feels like the universe is actively mocking you. Step 19, arrive at the desk once again. Be prepared to learn that you do not get a refund. Step 20, understand that you just wasted at least three hours of your life and almost $60 of your savings on an endeavor that ultimately ended up being for nothing.
take a bus home and wallow in pain and regret for at least half an hour. Step 21, try to look at the bright side of things. You know what it takes to officially set up a business. You now know where to go with your finances if, they are, if you ever get called to work as an agent during a provincial election. You now know that Safeway sells overpriced takeout that isn't worth your attention. You now know that you should print off your web pages from Elections Canada when you try to show proof that you are who you say you are. You now know a lot of things that you didn't know before, and you got to live through an unforgettable experience to fully take in the depth of all this knowledge. And besides, tomorrow is another day. That's a good story. We all have those stories, man. Happens. Yeah. We've all been there. That painful experience that sticks with you for the rest of the life, but still provides a valuable uh, teaching opportunity. That d dude, sometimes our pain is our pain is a is a great teacher. Sometimes it's the best teacher. Um, first time fell in love. You know, I learned an awful lot about that relationship, but the highs and the lows. Uh, I have both in my head. There are things I will never do again right? Because of the way I felt in those moments. Um, and that that's it. Like, like, you, our, our pain sometimes is our biggest informer. Right? Sometimes it makes us stronger. Sometimes it makes us bolder. Sometimes it like, like, sometimes though, it's just like, what an experience. And I've learned from this. And I'll never ever do this again, because I don't have that kind of time in my life. Right? Or in this go. case, I'd be willing to do it again. It's just that now I have the knowledge of how to make it a much more streamlined process. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And also, here's the thing, okay? You now can go to different political people and offer yourself as a campaign manager because you know what the hell you're actually, you have the experience of being a campaign manager. I don't have that experience, right? And you've been running and organizing you, you've ran and organized a campaign, whether it went to success or not, that's irrelevant. Like you did, you did your job. The win would make it look really nice. But the fact that you did it, there's not many people that have that, man. Yeah, I agree. It's something so, good to put on the resume. It's not only good to put on the resume, it's good to use. If you can run a campaign for a, poli for a politician, you can run a campaign for any product. Marketing is the same no matter what, the pro what what it is, whether it's a campaign or whether it's a, uh, a book or a podcast. A lot of the same skills are there. And you got the voice in the shades, right? Presumably, yes. Yes. Right? So that's a cool, ex I mean, that's a cool experience, man. I mean, I, I, th I think um, you learned a lot just on that one day. Did you learn anything else? Did you do anything else that was really cool? Like, what what was it about a political campaign that was really eye opening to you? I think, day? I think what was eye opening to me is just that when you're a no budget operation competing with someone who has a lot more money and influence than you, uh, you need to get really creative about what you're doing. You need to try and reach as many people as possible. Um, your party matters more than whoever is running as a candidate. The reputation of that party precedes the actual person who's running on the platform. And so, for example, uh, yesterday during the election, I happened to be uh, working election duty in two different roles. First three hours, I was an information officer. And for the rest of the day, I was a deputy returning officer. And as I was tallying up the votes, trying to figure out who won in my writing, um, there's nothing more disappointing than seeing someone win when you voted for another person entirely. But at the same time, uh, the guy who did win in my writing, uh, he's conservative. He's been serving the community for about six years now. Um, he's built up a good reputation. People know who he is. People trust him. Um, 
the, per the people who had the closest chance of winning against him were the NDP and the Liberals. I don't know the people who were running on those platforms, but I suspect that if anyone was voting for them, most likely it was because they were representing the NDP or the Liberal Party. And they just thought in their minds, I'll vote NDP or I'll vote Liberals and I'll get the party that I want in office. Um, I think for most people, they think, well, if I'm voting for the Liberals, then I'm voting for Justin Trudeau. If I'm voting for the Conservatives, I'm voting for Aaron O'Toole. Um, but that's not the way that Canada's election system works. Whenever you're voting at the polls, you are voting for the member of parliament that you want. Um, and whoever gets the most votes in an electoral riding uh, gets that seat. Whoever gets the most seats in parliament uh, gets to be the top party in government and their leader becomes the prime minister of Canada. Hmm. Yeah. And that's how you can have over 800,000 people vote for the people's party. And yet none of them, none of the candidates can get any seats. Okay. Well, we, we can go into, we can go into this one a little bit because I vote, I, I have the luxury of voting for, two countries i can vote for canada and i can vote for the united states and i voted and i voted and i can vote so i vote for both elections and i one of the things i've accepted one of the things i've accepted is that i understand that um the game's rigged no matter how you look at it and i'm not talking like they're rigging of votes or elections it's just there are democracy is not measured by a way that uh, a lot of people think it is I look at the fact that um, I interviewed Tony Phillips. He's a political writer. And one of the things he pointed out is that essentially the United States presidency was decided by 60,000 people. That's it. 60,000. 60,000 people changed the whole course of a country. Right. And that when you sit there and think about that, a country of 330 million, 60,000, it was really the, the swing vote. When you sit there and when you break it all down, I mean, that's not what people, that's not how people imagine democracy working, right? It's not, it's, but it is the way it is. Like the system, like even down there, they figured it out, like they, you're campaigning for a very small group of people to change their minds. That's, that is American politics. It just is. Canadian politics is the same, is the same thing. It's, it's all, so it's in that sense, in that sense, right? There are people that have, I mean, people feel this way too about if you look at um, people that voted liberal, people that voted NDP, people that voted libertarian, people that voted green. Um, what, what there, there has always been this ground swell of popularity here and in, 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 uh, throughout. But at the same time, sometimes just the way the writings are done, people don't win. The popular vote, how it actually measures and counts and records and what it actually indicates on the poll sometimes does not match up. And it hasn't for a very long time. And you kind of have to accept that. That said, I still vote. Because sometimes it's not even really about... Sometimes I don't vote. Sometimes I just feel like there's nobody I, can, I fully believe in. And if I don't believe in anybody, I'm not going to vote. Some people listening to this will be like, well, that's just... If I don't believe in anybody... I'm not going to vote for them. That's just what it comes down to. Bottom line. Some years, I do pick a candidate. Some years, I'll vote for myself. In the United States, sometimes I vote, I, I voted for my, I have voted for myself. Because there's nothing... Again, it comes down to faith. Some people will call that a protest vote or a waste of vote or throw away vote. No, it's just, this is my chance to express my opinion. That's it. It's an... It's, Voting is as much expression as it is about picking a candidate. So I decide that I have a say in the leadership of Canada. Even if I'm the only one that makes the saying, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to say it. Um, I don't worry about the result because, again, I just know that it's bigger than me. And you can see that like popular vote. But I think one of the biggest misconceptions about voting is 
popularity very is not what people think it is when you look at the polls um it's it's more it, there's a lot more to it than that and sometimes it's really amazing how surprising a small number of people in the right place can change everything and i don't know how to fix it i just don't maybe i don't know rearrange the the riding borders rearrange the seating that's, arrangements that's that that happens all the time usually usually leaders i mean i remember back in my history class talking way back in when i was in high school they would show he'd show old writings to things political leaders have changed writing borders on and on. it's a normal part of the business the guy the people the people in charge want to stay in charge as long as possible and they will do everything they can to get there. It's human nature. It doesn't matter. What, like it's not just a political thing. It's 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 a universal thing. If you're doing very well in this life, you're going to do everything you can to stay there, right? If you if you're not doing very well in this life, you're going to do everything you can to get out of your situation, right? That's human nature. There's no magic to that, right? So Trudeau has changed borders. His dad changed borders. Mulroney changed borders. Chrétien has changed borders, right? Um, Harper, the hell is, Martin. Uh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to think who was who the conservative guy. Stephen Harper. He changed borders too, right? Everybody has their time and their place, and and they last however long they're going to last, and right. And then these borders stay, and, and that's just how it goes. It, it has been that way. You can't. Like I said, there's no good solution to this problem. It's just the nature the nature of any any kind of thing, a popularity contest like this, is th there are borders, and the guys who are generally popular are going to do everything they can to stay popular. It might sound incredibly cynical, but this has been, as long as I've been alive, how it's been done. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. I think the real, the real solution, the real solution is, you know, um, isn't the government isn't going to change things. We are. We're going to make a decision to what is right and wrong, and we're going to vote in all kinds of ways. What we spend our money on, what we what we listen to, what what we choose to do what we choose to do like our choices matter our voice does matter but you're but it, it's expressed not just when you go to a poll it's expressed in what you do every day man like the restaurants you support the places you choose to go and live in yeah well, not just that just decisions you make every day and when you wake up yeah. Right. Are you going to look at what you can't do versus what you can do? Are you going to, are, are you going to look at, are you going to look at even in when we're at our most power, when we feel our most powerless, there are still a lot of choices we can make. Um, I, I, uh, this is sometimes, a, this is, I do do talk about books. One of my favorite quotes from Robert Jordan's Will of Time is, Take what you want and pay for it. And what that actually means is every decision we make has a price. Me choosing not to get the shot means that that as of tomorrow, as of tomorrow, I'm going to have a lot less access than what I've had to some things. The flip side is, okay. Do I really, really want access to these things? What is there going? What am I losing that I'm really losing right now? Convenient right. access to fast food. Well, that's the that's well, like like the thing about the pandemic. Here's the other thing about the pandemic, right? There's not there's not a lot of things really worth having in our system. If you sit there and think about it, okay, 
I've had no sporting events for 18 months to go to, really. But do I miss them? Somewhat, but do, do could I live without them? Yeah, I've proven that. Concerts. Now, outdoor concerts are still happening. Some some of them are happening with without the Vax Pass. Might still do those. Indoor shows. We'll see. Like, not really. Restaurants. I cook. I cook. I'm actually a decent cook, you know? I'm learning how to make my own booze. So I don't really need to go to a bar. I'd like to go out and do stuff, but I can still do that without going to any of these places. Like, it's going to get harder. It's going to get harder eventually. There, there are things about this that I am very, very worried about long term. But it, this is... But this is going to be up to Canadians all around the world, too. And not people all around the world. Um, about how they want to live, where they want to go, what they want to do. And then how do they want to live like going forward? Because inevit inevitably, um, inevitably, people are going to get tired of this too. But, but, I, but again, this is the world for now. This is the world people, have, the vast majority of people have chosen to truly live in this world. So for now, this is the world we're in. And we have to and walk it, man, one day at a time. That's all there is to it. One day people regret it. And I, I, I think I think that day will be sooner than later. I think that I th I I really think like honestly, honestly that um based on what I'm seeing, it's this this kind of life has never worked for any of this long, sustainable kind of time. Um, not without severe bloodshed, loss pain it has never it has never gone well but that is something that i think a lot of people have an idea what this is and i think what the reality is is much different i also have to be open to the fact that i could be wrong it's possible i don't think so but i it's possible right um so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. Like I don't think this is going to last. The only question I really have is how the path we go until we get to that point. And in the meantime, the way the true choice you got to make here for everybody is: Do you want to keep supporting a system that, by and large, we don't need anymore? And that's going to be the question going forward. Because even even in all this, there's an opportunity to create something new and better and wonderful and amazing. Yeah. You know, I think what's interesting about what you're saying as to what we can do. I have people who are frustrated about the status quo of the world. Mm -hmm. Some of the more extreme, unpleasant things like neo-fascism being mainstream um, or not necessarily mainstream, but being somewhat popular in underground circles. Um, you have billionaires who are able to keep as much of their money in savings as they want, and they're not doing anything with that money to say, help starving people or help people get out of poverty. Um, and I feel like certain friends of mine, their response to that has been, well, we need to go out and we need to destroy the fascists by physically attacking them and brutalizing them. We need to destroy the billionaires by, uh, protesting them and boycotting their services and demanding that they pay higher taxes because if they're not going to donate their money to the poor, then we're, we're, we, we don't see another way of redistributing the wealth. And I think going to that extreme, I feel like that in some ways it, it makes you go down a path where you have the opportunity to become a much worse person 
mm-hmm. than even the people you're fighting against. Um, it doesn't feel like a whole lot, but there's still a worthwhile benefit to helping out at a homeless shelter or helping out at a food bank or doing volunteer work yeah. elsewhere. Um, and I got news for you. There always will be. Yeah, there always will be. Um, like I, will. I was just, I was reading a book, which for meeting, not meeting, meaning um, by Viktor Frankl. And in it, he was talking about people who had just recently lost their jobs and how they fell into deep depression. Um, they were searching for some kind of meaning in their lives and they've lost that meaning because they had chosen to identify so strongly with their job. Um, and he said that they were still able to discover meaning if they chose to say, go do volunteer work, even though they weren't being financially compensated for it, even though they had no way of earning a living from it and paying their bills, they were still doing meaningful things. And that was, that was still gratifying for them. And I think that when it comes to the problems of the world, whether it's wealth inequality or racism or fascism, um, sometimes you need to step in and be the protector and say, this isn't going to stand. Um, but sometimes you can also just, you can do little things to make the world a better place. And in some ways, those are less destructive, more impactful than just being a crusading knight, if you get my drift. So, a lot to unpack. So let's, 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 let's come at this a bunch of different ways. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a, separate, for a second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Why should a billionaire give any of us money? I'm going to play devil's advocate for just a second. Okay. Why should a billionaire give us money? Um, what, what, okay, so like I'll, I'll, I'll speak, I'll speak from a perspective that I don't necessarily share because my immediate instinct to a question like that is that I don't care if a billionaire gives me money or not. Um, I, I, I care, like, I, I don't have a personal relationship with that billionaire. Mm-hmm. Um, that billionaire has no incentive to give me money if, if we if we don't have a personal relationship. I do care when there are friends of mine who are making more money than me, who are in better off than me, who see me in situations where I'm not doing so well and they refuse to help me out because it, it's too much of a bother for them. And okay. so that's so, that's my instinctual response to a question like that. The question, the, the response that I would give, imagining how one of my friends might respond to that, um, a billionaire has responsibility. They, through earning money, through earning earning a crap ton of money, they have acquired amount, a, a certain amount of responsibility to use that money for the good of others. And if they're not using that money in a way that can be tangibly felt, if they're like, if, if they have a billion dollars and they're not donating $250 million to various charitable causes that will help to alleviate starvation and poverty, um, then why aren't they taking it upon themselves to employ that kind of responsibility? Okay. So let me, that, I'm going to go down the devil's, the devil's advocate route just fully now. Okay. No one owed them a damn thing. And they still made it. Good, bad, or indifferent how they did it. They still did it. And if they can do it, you can do it. Why should, even in spite of, like, like I said earlier, going back to the very top of this whole thing, people want to stay on top. It's human nature. I got everything good. What do I care about anything else? I don't know you. 
I don't know your name. All I know is how far, how hard I fought to get to this point. And I fought really hard to get to this point because there was all, everybody wants to get to where I'm at. So why should I, and not why should I help you? I don't know you. I don't care about you. And given the chance, most people would take for me what I already have. I've had the opportunity to interview some really, really successful people. And one of the things I've, I've caught in with a lot of really successful people is they are very guarded when they meet new people. And one of the things, and I realized why, because everybody wants what they have in terms of how did you do it? How did you do it? And why am I still here? And they're very guarded about their time, their efforts, their causes, their energies. Now, some, some billionaires give significantly. I have a lot to say about Bill Gates, but the thing is, he donates about half his fortune. Like, he, he, he donates. Yeah, for better or for worse, he is doing what he believes he, right, right, is going to make the world a better place. Well, like, like I, I have other issues with him, but as far as that end goes, he does it. He ends up making even more money. Um, I think here's the thing, right? This is how I see it. I don't think anybody owes anybody anything. In fact, I would go so far as to say. I would go so far as to say that outside of whatever people agree to pay in terms of taxes to keep roads, schools, things of that nature up and running, I don't necessarily think anybody's obligated to help anybody else out. That includes friends. That includes family. Like, like, like I'm not owed anything by anybody. And I think that's a very... Um, Are you there, buddy? Did he disappear? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. Your your, your screen froze. Um, but what I I'm did not disappear. Is, okay, okay, it's cool. There's I'll finish my saying. Did too. If you pass it back, I think I think the idea that we owe each other is, I think, a very flawed one. Helping each other, like my decision to help people, should be based on my own choices. If I choose not to help somebody, that's also my own choice. Good, bad, or indifferent. I'm entitled to be an asshole. Um, that's just how I see it, and that's how I've always seen it. But I'm also entitled to help anybody I would, I'd go out of my way for. But it has to be a choice. It can't just be I'm made. Because if I'm made to do something, I tend to resent it. That's just that's my nature. And so all of that, all of that to say that um um, you know, I, I think, I think as far as now, there are other problems. I think the idea that these billionaires have hoarded way too much wealth and there's a big wealth disparity that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. But the thing is that has to do with how businesses compete. That has to do with the nature of oligarchies and corporations and the fact that they don't have a real governance and laws to put laws to put checks and balance into these companies would go an awful long way to mitigate some of the problems. The reason people are becoming more extreme is because you're trying to force people to go down this A or B rabbit hole. If you let people be free to make their own decisions and give the opportunities to make where let those decisions go somewhere, that has always worked better than trying to make people solve a problem force people to deal with something because that never works. Like if there's one thing about this time, right? Force for the sake of force never works out in the long run. And yet what ends up happening is eventually you stop fearing the consequences if you don't do it. And then you just say, fuck you. And that's it. And then, and then you have a revolution on your hands. Thoughts, Mr. Nathan? Yes, yes, you hear me. Okay, yes. Um, I think that some of people, sorry, some people in the world, they've taken the idea that the strong, the uh, brutal, those are the people who win things 
um, it's, it's not through ingenuity. It's not through being the underdog. Um, it's, it's through just having the greatest numbers, the greatest force imaginable. And if we can force people to do what we want them to do, then regardless of whether or not they enjoy it, we're still going to get what we want. Right? Mm, so now you're, talking, now you're talking about something else. Isn't that right? What is strong? What is force? Because all I have to do with anything, any mandate that comes down the pike in the future is just say no. Going back to something I said at the very beginning. Yeah. There's nothing they can really do to me. They can take the, they can try to take things away from me. But if I have no value in those things, it's meaningless. I don't have to cooperate. And that in itself is incredibly powerful, right? Um, you have to, you look at, you look at Romania, you look at Russia in terms of the VAX passes. Russia, they lasted all of three weeks. Romania, they have taken every vaccine clinic away. Because the, 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 they, the whole countries, both countries said, nope, not doing it. Just said no. We're not going to support this in any way. We're not going to do anything in any way. Right. Um, that's the, that's the thing, right? It's force. Force can be arms and numbers, but force could also just simply be the word. No, I'm not doing it. Well, you can't be part of the club. Okay. There's nothing you can do to me at that point. You can make me uncomfortable. Right, but there's really nothing you can do to me. I've said no. No gun on earth can make me say yes. That those countries that you're talking about, Russia and Romania, those are countries that used to be communist, and so they've already been through. Oh, they, they, well, yeah. uh, that, that's where, part of it. Like other countries, like other older countries are are fighting this in their own, are are doing different things in their own way. Russians are just by their very nature uncooperative. They just are. Uh, Roman Romania is an old country that has seen it's again grew up during World saw wars. They were they've been in the heart of these things. There's experience there for sure. But like I said, when when you get right down to it, right, the lesson you can learn from them isn't like where they've been, but where they're at. You're not going, you're not going to, um, if someone says no, you'll never, you can't make them say yes. It's one of the most powerful things you can do as a person. And that's anything. That's not just a mandate. That's a business deal. That is your choices in life, right? You can choose anytime you want to say no. And there's nothing anyone can do about it. Well, you made your choice. You're not going to get this. Like, okay, but you got to be honest with yourself of what you're what you're willing to lose. And I think the big other big difference. Also, you want to talk about the about if you've if you've lost everything before, what's going to happen to you now? Shrug. Right, you've been there. You don't want to go back, but you've been there. Doesn't yeah. scare you the same. It doesn't. It doesn't scare you the same way. It's frustrating, but it doesn't really scare you the same way. Inevit inevitably, you can make. You, again, you can. This is just a personal thing. You can. You can. There's no gun that can make me think for you. There's no bullet. That there's no. There's no gun that can make me think. There's no gun that can make me care. There's no bullet that can make me say yes. The only person that can do that is me. So, yeah, but again, it's what I'm willing to lose, right? If I'm willing to lose it all, then there's nothing anybody can do to me. Nothing. All, those, all that power is meaningless. 
But what you're seeing, but again, in a world like today, we as a culture have never been in a situation of extreme loss. Canada's very young compared to a lot of other countries. So that kind of loss has never happened here. If it did, it would it would it would retool how a lot of people thought. How my grandmothers, both of them think, is very different than how I think. My grandmother, my one grandmother was from Malta. During World War II, when she was a baby, uh, England was being, not England, Germany was bombing Malta for years. My other grandmother's from Germany. She, she was a runaway from after the Berlin Wall, the, right before the Berlin Wall was fully erected up. After Germany fell, she was a runaway. She survived because of my grandfather, who also grew up in Nazi Germany. So their whole way of thinking is completely different than mine. But I'm aware of I'm aware of what they thought and why they thought the way they did. And in some ways, it makes a lot of sense the way they think they did. But at the same time, my grandma, both my grandmothers are in their 80s. They don't really go out and do the day to day of the world anymore. They've lived their lives. They don't see the same things I've seen, right? So I'm seeing now they're past all that. They're at that point in their lives where they're just winding it down. There's nothing to do. There's no, what are you going to threaten them with? They, they've they lived their lives. I'm still trying to live my life, right? So I'm in a different point in life than they are. And I'm seeing the world as it's going on because I'm living in the world. And that's and that's it, right? Um, but understanding that understanding it's thinking canadians have never really have by and large have never been without it's hard to figure out who you're what you're capable of until you have nothing unfortunately that's where i think we're going but we'll see i hope i'm wrong but that's where i think we're going and and um that's that's the um That's the thing. So, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the same things. You can't make me say yes. Yeah. I know that I mentioned this in a Facebook post that I know you saw, but uh, I talked about all the reasons why I didn't want to get vaccinated. And one of those reasons was that uh, for about a year of my life, I was in dire poverty. I, I could only make enough money through government welfare to pay my bills. Uh, I couldn't go out and eat at best fancy restaurants with friends. I couldn't go out on camping trips with them. Uh, I couldn't travel to faraway places. I. I was just stuck and it was an extremely heartbreaking experience for me, extremely stressful experience as well. But I think that with that experience in a weird way, it was preparing me for a time like this where all of the privileges that I've had of being able to go to these fancy restaurants and participate in these that they're being stripped away because I don't want to get vaccinated. Um, there was a time in my life where they didn't matter because they couldn't matter. And in, in this time, uh, I guess I might have to go back to it. And it's probably not going to be a fun process in the long term. But I also know that I managed to make it through. I'm going to survive. And I'll continue to survive. That's it. You guys said what's important to you, right? And by the way, if you and anyone watching, listening, if you want to take the vaccine, go take the vaccine. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going to tell. You, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Right. I'm against the whole idea of the passport, but I'm not against anyone's choices for what they choose to do. You do what you want. I'm not here. I'm. I'm certainly not your judge, jury, or execution, your executioner. I. I don't care. Like, do you, do you, do you, um, 
but um like that's just it like we have a lot of power but we also have little power my, i'm not important enough where my decisions are going to change the course of the world and that's probably a good thing because i'm a little crazy right but that's that's me um that's how i see it um you know it, it's one of those it's one of those uh you have to be on again at the end of the day and i think we'll probably wrap up our chat here buddy because i think i, I think we've, we've we've covered a lot um at the end of the day no matter where you stand, how you stand, it's, it's about what you want, what kind of life you want to live, what you're willing to do to live this life. I like my freedom. I don't think freedom should be a privilege. I think it needs to be fought for, tooth and claw. I know a lot of people listening to this right now would argue this is freedom, and I would disagree humbly. Um, I'd humbly disagree with you. It, this is not what this, this is not freedom. This is about turning freedoms essentially into a light bulb. And I'm really, really against that idea. Um, so that means that for me, at least in the short term, I'm going to be fighting this tooth and claw. Now, maybe inevitably it becomes the way it is. And at that point, I'm going to figure out what I really want to do. But at the end of the day, that's going to be my decision. I'm going to make my own choices based on what I think is right. And the worst that could, the worry for me, because I am such an insignificant part of the world in the grand scheme of things, the worst that can happen from my perspective is I could be wrong. And I'm okay with that. And I'm willing to pay those prices if I am wrong. But you got to be an adult about it. No point. In, there's no good skate. Being a little scared is a normal thing. But what do you want? And at the end of the day, that's what you got to choose to do. And ultimately, I think the good thing about what you want, you want to write books, you want to host a podcast, you want to write articles as a freelancer. And none of those things, none of what you want is going to be impeded. You losing out on all of the things that are now being denied to you. It, it, it's not even so it's not i don't want i want to be self-governed that's what this ultimately comes down to i want to be self-governed because i recognize that as long as as long as you are in a system of some kind you're not in full control so as, as, again one of the big things about my whole arc has been becoming self-employed and doing all the things i'm going to do and I'm making money writing, right? Putting my words to paper and I'm doing it a lot, like comparatively. And it's really, really cool. Um, but I have to make those choices, right? I made that choice and it's, and I knew when I made this choice, it was going to be a very uncomfortable experience. This month I did not make any money at all, really. Right. Next month I make money. November, I make money. December, I make money. How much? I don't know yet. But that's what. I, that's it. Like this is it. It's a scary. It's a scary up. It's a scary down. It's scary up. It's scary down. But I made that choice willingly. I could have stayed at my job, and I, I, I'd have been great. Especially during last year, I would have been just fine. In some ways, it would have been better. It would have been smarter in some ways, but I wouldn't have learned the lessons I know now either. So. This is this is the thing, right? We all take life is risk. Even this life is risk. There's there, there's there's you know there's a lot of ways this could go. And at the end of the day, life is risk. You got to do at the end of the day, life is risk. And no matter how uncomfortable you make me, I can again going back. What do you want? What will you say yes to? What will you say no to? And will you stick to it when it gets hard? Are you willing to pay that price? At this point, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. But that's that's it. That's that's it, man. That's the end of the day. And honestly, there's nothing anyone can do to you. Right? They can try burning off my testicles. Okay, dude, seriously. 
<laughs> Seriously. Anyway, man, I think I think we have an interview here. Why don't you tell people about your podcast? Why don't you tell people about anything else you'd like to advertise and how people can find you? Okay, so my podcast is called Because We're Not the Same, produced by Nathan Raymond Ray. Uh, it's available to stream on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Verbal, I believe. And the idea is that it's doing what you and I are essentially doing, albeit in a slightly more structured format. Uh, we did an episode together. Uh, I believe I titled it, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You a Writer. And that was you sharing your journey of what you've been through, uh, how you almost got yourself killed by putting yourself in a very uncomfortable place. Uh, and what you've been able to glean from your experience as a writer. Uh, and I think that's the episode where the show got good, in a sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is, that is a great title for Podcast with Josh. And maybe, who knows, maybe I'll bring Josh on as a co-host for 10 episodes, and we'll just talk with each other. And... Who knows? Who knows? Uh, it'd be it'd be nice to have you on. Yeah, sure. We can talk the about show it. again. You come back for another interview? Oh, not not a problem. As a host, I mean you got that that that's going to take some the, some of this. I don't do that for free. So, <laughs> but um, a dollar per episode does that work? Fifteen dollars an hour. Fifteen dollars an episode does that? Work? Dude, my rate my rates are like I do fifty bucks an hour, man. <laughs> dang, dang. Okay. <laughs> So, um, that's what I'm doing, uh, of importance in my life. I think that people can just look at and reference. There are other projects that I'm working on that I can't talk about because people's livelihoods are at stake. Um, I haven't been productive with my writing as much as I want to when it comes to writing fiction, as I've mentioned before. But when that happens, hopefully I'll be able to bring something more to the table. For now, please go to Spotify, go to Apple Music, go to Podbean, type in the words because we're not the same, and you'll be able to find me talking with random people and trying to have productive, meaningful conversations with those I know who are different than me in some way. Well, thanks, Nathan, for coming on my show. Well, a couple things before we wrap up. It looks like I will be back in Calgary sometime early next month. Sometime. I I, I won't I won't say when, where, or how yet. I have a I, I'm trying. Some, I, there are some things I'm kind of checking out. Like I said, stay tuned for some cool, hopefully, some cool announcements really, really soon. That all said, um, one thing, Jay, I have gotten that. That's just the thing. I don't work cheap. And you, there's a, a big piece of advice I've always gotten as a freelancer is don't work for free and don't charge yourself cheaply because the, honestly, the more you charge, the less work you have to do. He was right. He's absolutely correct. Anyway, um, that's another podcast for another day. For those watching, for those listening, my sponsor this month is Jennifer Lieberman, Lieberman's Year of the What?, uh, check out her newsletter. Link is always going to be in the episode descriptions. Uh, you can see that now on the on, currently on my audios. Just go click on the link, sign it up, and you go and uh, and go uh, put enter your name into that. That Jen will be giving away some books at the end of the month. Jen's awesome. Definitely check her out. Uh, stay tuned. I got some announcements for sponsors next month coming up very shortly as well. Uh, my Twitch t channel is just Joshing Podcast. Hit the like follow button. Hit YouTube, like, subscribe, enable notifications of Joshua Pentelaresco. Alice Zero is nominated for the Elgin Awards, available now on Amazon. And Alice One is tentatively released for November 1st. But like I said, stay tuned. I might be pushing it back just slightly, only because, frankly, I just got some enough, a lot of stuff to do in October. Stay inspired. Keep shining in the dark. I will be back tomorrow with a gentleman by the name of Rodney Fike. He's coming back for some more. Probably going to see if I can draw some stuff on the, on the stream. 
Thanks, Nathan, for coming. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And I'll see you guys tomorrow night. Farewell.